In the Chem Activity number 7, and in the corresponding videos, we will be exploring infrared spectroscopy. This is a technique that helps us determine the structure of organic molecules. It's one of a suite of three techniques that we use to determine structure, the other two being mass spectrometry and nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Infrared spectroscopy is particularly useful to determine the functional groups that are present in a molecular structure. Now inherent in the name, this technique involves the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it involves studying the interaction of electromagnetic radiation, or in other words, light, with matter. And by studying this interaction, it helps us understand the sorts of functional groups that are present. Let's review a little bit the properties of light and some of the equations we use to describe light. Here's an important equation, very simple, but it tells us that the speed of light is exactly equal to the wavelength of the light, and we use the symbol lambda to represent the wavelength, times the frequency, and we use the symbol nu to describe the frequency. This very simple equation allows us to see that the wavelength and the frequency are inversely proportional. If the frequency goes up by a certain factor, the wavelength will go down by that same factor. Now it's helpful to rearrange the equation to solve for nu, so we can see that is equal to c over lambda, and it's helpful because we're also interested in that the energy of a photon is directly proportional to the frequency. So this equation, E is equal to H, and H is Max Planck's constant, times the frequency, shows that as the frequency increases, the energy of light increases. This should not be a surprise to you, because that form of light of high frequency, in other words, the cosmic and the gamma rays, the X-rays, they are all of high energy. Whereas things like microwaves or radio waves have low frequencies and they are of low energy. If we plug in our rearranged equation for nu into this energy equation, we can see that the energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So the higher the wavelength, the lower the energy of our light. Now for historical purposes, it's been more practical or easier to work with a term called the wave number. Now the wave number is equal to 1 over the wavelength. As it turns out, when 1 is divided by a wavelength in the infrared portion of the spectrum, quite a manageable number is obtained, and these numbers are used in the spectroscopy. So a new term was used, instead of using frequency directly or the wavelength directly, we use this wave number. Note that the wave number has units of centimeters to the minus one. So this is not units of distance, but rather the reciprocal of distance. And essentially, it's a reflection of frequency. So the wave number is directly proportional to the frequency. Or in other words, we can also say that the energy is directly proportional to the wave number. So wave number will be a reflection of the frequency. Let us see how infrared spectroscopy can tell us something about the sorts of functional groups that are present in a molecule. So I'm using this very simple analogy. Picture on the left, we have an adult pushing a child on a swing. And if the adult and the child's swing are in resonance, it means that as the adult pushes, they impart energy to the swing. And of course, the child and the swing get pushed forward. So energy is transferred from the adult to the swing. Whereas if the adult was pushing for some reason while the swing is in a different spot and is not imparting any energy, so is out of resonance, no energy is transferred. So if the frequency of pushing matches the frequency of swinging, then we say the two are in resonance with one another. What does this have to do with infrared spectroscopy? Well, the idea is that if energy is imparted onto a molecular structure, and if that energy is in resonance 
with vibrations of the bonds in that molecule, well then energy will be imparted, energy will be absorbed, and this can be detected. And so that's the connection between this silly diagram and the infrared spectroscopy. What sort of vibrations occur? Well, here we have some examples in the teaching model number three. And essentially, although you know, when we draw bond line drawings and ball and stick models, we have a picture of atoms in position in a static way, a more realistic way of thinking about it is that there's constant vibrations going on in various kinds of motions, and these move with a certain frequency. So if energy is imparted on a structure, and it, this is usually in the infrared portion of the spectrum, and if that energy is in exact resonance with the vibration of these bonds, well then that energy will be absorbed and temporarily the molecule will be brought to an excited state. Now these are static diagrams. It's helpful to actually picture what this might look like. So for instance, we have these symmetrical stretches or asymmetrical stretches. And whenever I see these diagrams, I, I kind of picture that the molecules are doing some kind of calisthenics. So you can picture these guys are in the gym. So those are stretching vibrations. We also have bending vibrations. So you can see the symmetrical in-plane bend and the symmetrical in-plane rock. And then of course we have these out-of-plane bends. And so we also have the asymmetrical out-of-plane bend, which is known as the WAG. So there's some creative terms that describe these various motions. Now you're not responsible to know these exact names, but just have a picture that all of these things are going on as the atoms within a molecule are interacting with one another. In teaching model number four, I introduced this equation. I'll never ask you to do an actual calculation with this equation, but I think it's helpful to know what would affect the wave number or the frequency of the light that's absorbed. And there are two main things to be thinking about here. So in this equation, the F term, which is referred to as the force constant, is essentially a reflection of the bond strength. So you, as you might imagine, a greater wave number, a greater frequency is required with a greater bond strength. Now it's not a direct proportional because we've got this root term, but they're definitely related in a direct way. In a similar fashion, the wave number is related to the masses of the atoms that are making up the bonds in the molecule. Now it's not a, a simple mass, it's something that we call a reduced mass, it's kind of like an average mass, but in this case there's an inverse relationship. The greater the masses of the atoms that are involved in the bonds, the lower the wave number required. So we can summarize these things in the following way. If we say, well, what's the relationship between the mass and the wave number? And as the mass goes up, the wave number will go down. Now this is represented by the first row. So if we consider, for instance, a series of bonds between carbon and other atoms, carbon and hydrogen, carbon and deuterium, all the way to carbon and chlorine, we're keeping the carbon constant, but of course the other atom's mass increases from hydrogen to chlorine, and you can see indeed the wave number in centimeters to the minus one goes down. Now again, it's not necessary to memorize these numbers, but if you're trying to figure out, well, where would I expect an absorbance of energy corresponding to a particular kind of bond, having these connections will be helpful. The other relationship has to do with the F term, or the force constant, which is related to the bond strength. And according to the equation, of course, these are directly related. This is represented by the bottom row in the box at the bottom of the screen. So we've got a series of sets of bonds between carbon and nitrogen. As you might imagine, there would be a greater wave number associated with the triple bond compared to the double and the single bond. When we look at infrared spectroscopy, we'll see that the typical wave numbers range from about 500 up to 4,000. Characteristically, we'd expect that the single bonds are going to occur at lower wave numbers, 
Double bonds occur somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 wave number units. And then finally, the triple bonds occur somewhere around the 2,100 to 2,300. Bonds to hydrogen, as we shall see, often will occur in that region of 2,700 to 4,000. Now, although this is a single bond, it's a bond to an atom that has a very small mass. And so this is why we'd expect it to occur in that region. You will have available to you charts that allow you to connect functional groups to specific wave numbers. But it's still helpful to have a sense of where you'd expect to have certain kinds of absorbances corresponding to particular types of bonds. Now a couple of things about what the actual spectrum is going to look like. One of the unique things about an infrared spectrum is that the peaks actually go down. And so in this diagram here, there are two peaks and they're pointing down. And, and that would correspond to an absorbance. So actually, the y-axis in an infrared spectrum is usually represented as percent transmittance. So that zero absorbance corresponds to 100% transmittance. So those, that flat region in the spectrum indicates those regions where there's no absorbance of light. And 100% absorbance corresponds to, of course, zero transmittance. Let us say we have an infrared source, and that infrared light is passed through our sample. And to connect to how this absorption of light would then translate to the spectrum, let us look at the situation where we have a longer wavelength. So, of course, this would correspond to a lower frequency. And that would give rise to, for instance, the peak that's indicated. And then the next situation is we have a shorter wavelength, which, of course, would correspond to a higher frequency. And that would give rise to that particular peak. So again, the peaks are pointing downwards. Here I'm showing you two actual spectrum for two alcohol type molecules. You can see at the top of the diagram, I once again remind you those typical regions to find single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, and bonds to hydrogen. The main point I'd like to make in showing you these two spectra is to distinguish between diagnostic versus the fingerprint region of a spectrum. The diagnostic region will generally tell us what functional groups are present. The diagnostic region is generally from 1500 onwards. So the diagnostic region would be pointing this way. So I'll just abbreviate DA, DIA like this. And again, diagnostic pointing this way. You can see for these two spectra, the diagnostic region is quite similar. And we'd expect this because both of these involve alcohol molecules. So let's draw out the structure. They're both involving a three carbon chain. 2-propanol has the alcohol group on carbon number two. And 1-propanol has the alcohol group on carbon number one. So the diagnostic region of an infrared spectrum cannot distinguish between the 2-propanol and the 1-propanol. You can see that there's a very broad peak that's occurring just about right here and just about right here. And you will become very familiar with that this corresponds to an oxygen-hydrogen stretch that corresponds to the alcohol group. So anytime you see a stretch that corresponds from about 3200 to 3600 centimeters to the minus one, that corresponds to the alcohol group. You can see that of the spectra also has this region. And what this corresponds to is a carbon-hydrogen vibration where the carbon is sp3 hybridized. And so again, carbon-hydrogen where the carbon is sp3 hybridized. So the diagnostic region doesn't distinguish between the two molecules, but it verifies that indeed both of these molecules have the alcohol functional group and of course have carbon-hydrogen bonds, which as you might expect, would be very common in most organic molecules.
The fingerprint region is found below the 1500. Now sometimes we can pick out certain functional groups within the fingerprint region and so it'll be helpful to look carefully in the fingerprint region. But as you can see, often that region of spectrum is quite messy and sometimes it's hard to pick out particular functional groups. What is true, however, is if you suspect that your molecule is 2-propanol, you run the spectrum, then you go to the literature and compare your spectrum to the literature spectrum for 2-propanol. And if your compound is 2-propanol, that fingerprint region has to match exactly. That fingerprint region is very characteristic of exactly what 2-propanol should look like. And so every molecule will have a very unique fingerprint region.